Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Todd Moore, and uh, yes, I do a lot in open source. Um, usually, I'm giving this talk mostly to developers, but uh, what I'm going to talk to you about, and all you saw in that, I'll explain in, in just a minute. I'm the on-the-ground side of the innovation. Grady is going to take you through the history of some of the things we've done with space. And, uh, and what I'm here to do is to talk to you a little bit about an effort that uh, we've launched uh, in partnership with the United Nations, the American Red Cross, uh, the Linux Foundation, and, and many other companies now who've joined in. And it's called the Call for Code. Um, I spend uh, you know, a lot of time and, and have for many years um, working with leading open source organizations. And if you look across the computing landscape now, if you look at every piece of equipment that we have, um, every application that we develop, you'll find open source software in there. Um, ubiquitous, uh, uh, the very nature of things these days is usually Linux of some form, whether it's embedded or running as an operating system on the platform that you're, you're running, uh, running in a container, et cetera. Um, web serving, right, HTTP server that came out of Apache, those kinds of things are absolutely ubiquitous out there. And, and this history of, of going from um, a very, you know, simple base of, of open source that gets accepted by the enterprise that we help lead through the Linux uh, effort to now uh, companies coming together and building um, outrageous horizontal scalable platforms that allow for interoperability and set de facto standards uh, for computing. Um, examples of that, the Cloud uh, Foundry organization, half of the Fortune 500 companies now run Cloud Foundry. There's 3,000 developers who have contributed to it. Uh, if you look at uh, things like Linux, Linux has 1,600 developers, uh, 225 companies, 24 million lines of code that are actively out there being managed by people out in the open. Um, to the latest technologies in container orchestration, Kubernetes has taken the world by storm. Um, your development teams are using that to move uh, basically containerized applications uh, and manage them and orchestrate them and, and basically build the applications, the cloud native applications of the future. There are 1,600 companies involved in, in Kubernetes now, contributions from. 21,000 developers have, have made contributions. It's just astounding that we can now build out in the open, um, openly governed with uh, many, many other partners, the software that's basically running the world and will set the future for, for the world. So in, in development, um, there's just nothing like it that's ever happened before. And it's really been uh, you know, a, a journey from the early, you know, late 1990s, early 2000s until now um, that has, has gone about and done this. And of course, one of the key linchpin technologies for tracking and building and doing things is, is going to be blockchain. And the Hyperledger project is, is now out there with hundreds of companies engaged in that and hundreds of developers as well, too. So, so we're, we're seeing a change in the way that things are developed. And our developers are out there uh, participating, many of them in their off hours. Uh, some of them, of course, as, as you know, corporate sponsored individuals. I have hundreds of individuals who work for me out in leading open source organizations making a difference every day. And, and so it's become the foundation of everything that we do, as I said. Um, so at the cloud, uh, we're seeing container-based uh, orchestration and management uh, really take over. Um, we see technologies like Cloud Foundry that allows you to build basically a programming platform as a service and use the latest run times to go and build your applications, whether it's Node, Swift, Java, et cetera all done uh, in a cloud-native fashion. Of course, AI, um, we see System ML, Cafe, Torch, PyTorch, others, TensorFlow as leading technologies and at the application level, layer, um, a standard host of, of things going on there, including things like the open API work that is standardizing how APIs are presented to folks and making it very easy to build composite applications. So great stuff has been happening and, and allowing you to build things, right? It hasn't really been the purpose or, or effort of open source to really go and build vertical applications, though. Lots of great infrastructure work we as companies can get together and do and build out, and everybody is, is really excited about doing that. So it, you know, at IBM, um, it's, it's a part of our DNA. It's, 
something that we helped to go and create. Um, you, you know, our commitment into Linux, the work that we did, the billion dollars that we, we committed there, all the code that we committed, the, the code that we committed into Eclipse for Java, et cetera, these things uh, set the stage. So I get the opportunity to manage this for the IBM company. And in IBM, if you're going to contribute or uh, consume open source code, you have to uh, come through my organization. Um, and uh, we basically have everybody come through and certify that they know what they're doing so that we don't make any mistakes. And 78,000 IBMers annually come and certify. That's, that's a large part of our 400,000 population is engaged in some way in open source. Um, we consume 40,000 different packages out of open source every year. Um, we contribute tremendously. We're in the top four contributors of, of all in, in open source all the time. Um, in one month, typically, there'll be greater than 10,000 commits into the open source world out into GitHub and other places like that. Tremendous amount of software going on there. And thousands of IBMers engaged at any given time around the world doing open source. So I, I say this really just to sort of set the stage. That, that there's tremendous amount that's coming out of my company and other companies, and I'm sure members of, of the development community within yours, but, but we can do more. And, and that's my theme for today, is, is we can do more. Um, we haven't tackled significant challenges that uh, face humanity in, in any kind of vertical way together as a development community. And uh, I, I had the opportunity to work with the David Clark cause, uh, who, who gets people together to do these kinds of things and to brainstorm some ideas of how we might go about doing this. And, and what we came up with was basically a multi-year effort, something where we could get companies and developers to come and come together and do more, right? Because we were seeing things like natural disasters as being really the, the world challenges that we had to go and tackle. Right. Um, it, 2017 was one of, I guess, in the top three years of, of natural disasters. We saw flooding, quakes, et cetera. It was, it was a terrible year with, with a tremendous amount of, of devastation that happened. Um, within my own uh, Texas, I um, come from the Austin, Texas area. With my friends in Houston, we saw terrible flooding. Those folks will be recovering from that for years. Um, in, from a personal perspective, Superstorm Standy uh, up in New Jersey, we have a, a home uh, uh, up there as well, too. And um, we got hit by that. And I ended up with you know, a, a large pile, um, 50 feet long, four feet wide, four feet high, of debris after Superstorm Sandy, and, and watched the whole area try to clear out of that, where they build mountains of debris, and they had to remove it. And then the very slow process of seeing the area rebuild and the houses rebuild, it's, it, it's something that takes a tremendous amount of effort, and it takes a community to go and do that. And, and we keep seeing this over and over again. So as I said, one of the worst years. Uh, weather events are inevitable. Earthquakes and other natural disasters are inevitable. Um, we really just need to figure out how to do better at, at being prepared and, and mitigating them. So since 2000, we've seen 2.5 billion people now directly affected um, by disasters. Um, I happened to be in China uh, giving this talk uh, just as they were coming up on their 10th anniversary of the Wenchuan um, earthquakes. 70,000 people died, uh, 300,000 people injured, um, and it left the area very unstable. Uh, they had quake lakes that formed that as it rained and filled up, suddenly they had other disasters happening right in behind the disaster that they had had. Right? So these are things that technology can help monitor, that technology can help mitigate some of the damage by warning people. Right? Um, a trillion and a half in economic impact since 2013. Uh, these storms are massive that we've been seeing. There's billions of dollars in damage. We've all seen the headlines. Um, but flooding is really up. You know, flooding is, is something that we have to deal with now. Uh, water table, water levels have risen. Uh, the storms have gotten uh, more intense. Uh, being able to make use of the data, especially the data we're collecting from space, and being able to help sort things out is, is just an imperative now. So what we've looked at is how to go and bring together a group of folks to make people more resilient, um, to help safeguard folks. 
uh, to build infrastructure, but also to then build applications that can go and, and basically fill this void that we find here. So 22 million, 28 million, I think the Linux Foundation has estimated now that it's up to about 28 million developers work out in open source around the world. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to come together and get some fraction of those folks to come and take on some of these problems, right? To answer this call for code that, uh, that we've gone and thrown down with, with folks like the UN and the American Red Cross. Oops. So that's what we've done. Um, we partnered up. We have other companies coming in all the time. There's also venture capitalists, and the winners of this will, it's a contest sort of thing, um, with uh, venture capitalists uh, being available to help move these projects along. But also IBM is, is gonna do uh, its bit in here too. We've pledged uh, $30 million in effort um, over the next five years, and the IBMers who work out in the IBM Foundation, who do efforts like this sort of quietly on the side that you don't know about all the time, will be out taking uh, the winning solutions and bringing them to places that need them. Um, so our developers are gonna take on working with uh, the uh, projects that become the winners in this to bring them out into the world. Um, so by the end of, of August, we'll narrow it down or thereabouts to about 30 projects as the potential winners. And then guys, folks like uh, Linus Torvald, right? Very famous uh, in, in the Linux Foundation world as one of you know, the inventor of Linux. Um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee and others will be available to go and uh, judge the, the works as well as others. And uh, they'll be um, basically a winner of this with a monetary prize and other things that developers can go and get. So we're hoping that this energizes our development teams, that it brings them together. Um, but more importantly, the companies who engage with us in this too will get help and support from, from IBM as well. Um, we'll parachute people in, we'll help you with technologies, we will um, make it easy for you to get going, we'll run hackathons with your teams, we'll let them see a lot of the patterns and technologies that we've developed, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, and you'll get a chance to um, get engaged and, and maybe come up with some winning solutions for folks. And so, so what is this pattern stuff? So in, in IBM, we re recognized that uh, developers are on a journey, right? There's a flood of technology. I have like the coolest job in IBM. I, I get to work with uh, leading technologies that are just on the bleeding edge of things that are being done out in software. And it's really neat. I've watched all of the, you know, the most recent things come together and help shape them, had my hands in them, looked at the code, worked on the code, deployed it myself, played in, in this part of it as, as one of the mentors for it. And, and what we found is that complex tasks, really um, developers will benefit from having things that are good examples that they can go and draw on. So we, we took that idea and said, okay, for the call for code, we'll develop pattern, patterns and other materials that'll jumpstart people. And in the IBM uh, open source uh, sites that we have, you, you'll find a variety of software that's already pre-canned in patterns that you can go and pick up and, and use. So three of the examples that I have here are, are fairly simple, right? Um, Node-RED, Node-RED's a technology that was developed in IBM. It's open sourced out at the JavaScript Foundation. It's incredibly popular out there. It allows you to rapidly prototype applications, wire them up together. There's a whole community of people building drivers for all sorts of interesting devices and other things so that you can get going on it. It runs on TD platforms. It's actually, uh, if, when you bring up a Raspberry Pi, it's, it's standard now in, in your operating system menu. You just go pull down from the shell, you'll find that, that uh, you already have Node-RED available to you. So um, some of the team has uh, built up uh, some software to go and track uh, the International Space Station and other satellites using Node-RED and Watson. Um, I like tracking satellites. I'm an amateur radio operator, track satellites, talk to the ISS. Um, really enjoy that myself. Uh, also using NASA data in Watson Studio, our machine learning team has uh, started looking at wildfires so they can classify them and predict uh, how intense they're gonna be. Um, we have uh, some visual recognition software that's been put together uh, to look at world cities and identify them through space. 
So there's you know, code that you can get going with and, and solve problems with and use as a basis of building some kind of solution that then does something else to, to help people along. You, do, you can stand on the shoulders of the giants who have been working there and get going quickly. So we'll help you go and do that as, as we go through this. So please come by the booth. Um, you'll be able to see much more of this. And uh, developer.ibm.com slash code is the, the place where you'll find all the patterns and, and a lot of other great information on how we do open source and how we uh, participate out in communities and connect you with experts. Um, we believe very heavily in, um, in enabling developers. Developer advocacy is, is one of the things that my team does as well, too. So you know, if you need to find an expert and get engaged, um, we're there to help you. So you come to the code site, become an IBM coder, you'll, you'll get great support. So there's three ways that um, we're asking folks to get engaged here. Uh, commit to the cause, push for change, answer the call. I'll explain what those mean. So just in commit, it's, it's basically come and participate. You go back home, tell your folks about it, talk about it on social media, come and engage with us, uh, pass it on to your developers that this is going on. Right? It's, it's hopefully going to you know, change the world for, for folks. And, and, in this year, we're working you know, to, to mitigate disasters. Right? So pass that on to your teams. Um, become part of the social organizations that's driving the message around this. Push for change. Uh, if you assign in your company a code captain who's going to go out and, and work and energize your base and come together, we'll help you. Um, we'll give you support and aid. Um, we, we've been running hackathons around these things, helping people get going, getting their ideas together, bringing in uh, experts on disaster preparedness and recovery and uh, health issues and other things into these uh, forums. I've personally gone and kicked off around the world, a number of them, and it's great to see the ideas that flow out of this, that people are using technologies like blockchain and AI and uh, container-based applications to figure out how to, in a cloud-based way, solve things and, and do it very quickly. So get a code captain assigned, join in with us. We'll help you. We'll get you a kit. We'll help you get going and, and building uh, code and hackathons and getting ideas flowing. Um, but if you want to go further, you can be a sponsor in this as well, too. Many companies are coming and joining us every day and, and signing up for this. And, uh, and with that, um, you'll get much more enablement, you'll get visibility, we'll promote the things that you're doing as well too. And uh, hopefully you can you know, socialize and, and help us go and do this. You can sponsor this. We put our money in, we hope others will come and join us as well as sponsors. Um, even open source organizations have done this. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation, as an example, has signed on as one of the sponsors because they, they saw this as a natural fit for the kind of work that they're doing. So please come answer the code, uh, the call here, and, and we can help you do that too. So, so those are my three messages. Hopefully, um, uh, you know, I'm not too far off the topic of, of what we do here in space. Space-based data is going to help us do a lot of this. And uh, the technologies and the teams that you have have been a great enabler. And, and please come and join us out in this and, and join us in the open source projects that we go and do. So thank you. And, now we'll talk to the space-based side of it. Grady. Thank you. In the movie by the same name, Moana with the demigod Maui, isn't that a great job title? Demigod Maui. I want that on my business card. Uh, travel from her home to the fictional island of Tefiti across open ocean. The ancient Polynesians who actually came from the very real island of Tahiti to the islands of Hawaii covered 2,600 miles of open ocean. And they used a technique called wayfaring, where they especially looked at the skies and used that to guide their way. If you were to make it to the islands of Hawaii and ascend the sacred summit of Haleakala, this is what you would see in the night sky. The sky calls to us, said Carl Sagan. If we do not destroy ourselves, someday we will venture among the stars. Let me pause for a minute. I'm going to get to the geeky stuff in a minute, but let's pause there. 
you all are doing some incredible things. But in the midst of the political battles you face, the tedium of the daily stuff, the budget stuff, don't forget that this star is called to you, and that's probably why you are here. Each one of you has a story to tell in response to that call. Don't forget that. I was called to the stars back when I was 15 by the most marvelous movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I remember I'd built my first computer when I was 12, and this you know, dates me because I'm way back in the 60s. This is out of Schottky TTL. It was fun stuff. I finally then discovered software that I saw this movie, and I realized my eyesight was never going to be good enough that I could be an astronaut, but I could be behind the scenes, and I'm quite content to do that. But I saw this movie and utterly changed me, but it changed me in a way that may be a little, un un a little bit unsuspecting. There's this great scene where they're starting to dock with a space shuttle. If you look really close, you'll see this logo that looks familiar. <laughs> ah. Now, I didn't join IBM out of college from the Air Force Academy. I was borged into IBM. You'll know what that means. In 2003, I started up Rational Software. IBM acquired us. But I kind of always had this passion for combining what I was doing in software with space. By the way, if you look closer in one of the later scenes when Dave is out there trying to open the pod bay doors, look closer on his arm and you'll see an IBM logo as well too. Ooh, little trivia detail. So, but I looked at this movie in a very, very different way when I saw these scenes. I saw this stuff and I said, man, that is so cool. That's gonna take a hell of a lot of software. And so that's where my passion was. My story in response to the call of the stars was, I wanted to write the software behind that. And there's a lot of software that has to be written to get us there. IBM has a long and amazing history in the space program. In the movie Hidden Figures, we highlighted what we did in the beginning Mercury program and the like, fantastic work. Move forward to the days of Apollo, and there we were with our crew on the ground helping along the way. We also built the computer that was inside the Saturn instrument unit, the guidance system for the Saturn itself. Uh, this is, I guess, one that's, I forgot where this is. You probably know this more than I do. Just a, a picture I grabbed. Uh, but we built the, built the machine inside it. In fact, we even built the machine that was inside Skylab and the space shuttles. It was remarkable to see how these things reduced. This is basically an IBM 360 in a box that we reduced down to it. So we have a long and wonderful history in the space program, and we've not forgotten it by any means. Now, there's this wonderful tension that goes on, in, in, in Tom, my friend, has, has told me some of this, between the desire to put actual humans out in the world, out beyond the world, and robots. As it is said, Mars is the only known planet inhabited solely by robots. I'm told that perhaps half of the planets in our solar system have either robots on them or orbiting them or passing by them. So humanity has extended its reach through these kind of devices. And yet, we still know that having humans there is essential. But being an astronaut is not an easy job. It's a cool job, but it's not an easy job. You're in a complex environment. You're dealing with procedures that are incredibly intense. You may be running experiments that are outside of your field of expertise. You've got to know them. There are time pressures, and you're isolated. This is true not just of going to the moon, but imagine going beyond. So this raises a whole host of questions, and us on the software side call in response to that, what can software do to aid the astronaut along the way? There's an interesting story that comes from the Aurora 7 mission with Scott Carpenter, where we began to see some of this interplay between human and machine. Um, the original Mercury astronauts, uh, of course, being mostly fighter pilots, if not all of them were, they wanted a joystick. They wanted to control the device. And we know that there were tensions between them because they didn't really need to control it. And in fact, there was worries that if they did control it, it would mess things up. In the Aurora 7 mission, uh, Scott Carpenter was given control of some of the thrusters. He was given the opportunity to actually orient the vehicle. But there was also machinery to do that for him. And as it turns out, the two kind of got in conflict with one another. That uh, 
he left the machinery on while he was moving things and we were getting very, very low on, on fuel for the thrusters, dangerously low. So we know that there is work to be done in these human machine interfaces and we're truly at the point where the machinery with which we're dealing is so complex that the human simply can't respond in time. How then can we offer the machines to provide augmentation to the human? Many of us probably have an Alexa sitting in our room. And if you're watching the video of this from your home, and I said, Alexa, go buy me 10 pounds of cat food. Sorry about that. <laughs> Alexa and Google, uh, uh, Google Home and, and uh, Cortana are at one end of the spectrum. Iron Man is at the other end of the spectrum. I guess in past times, Elon has taken this slot. So this is his, this is his proxy. Iron Man here. If you look between the two, there's a vast difference. And let's consider that difference. And I put it along three axes. On the one hand, uh, folks, the, the Jarvis behind Iron Man has a degree of personalization. It knows about the human. It actually has a model of itself. So there's some sense of, of, of something else there. There's a sense of agency with Alexa or say Google, hey Google, go do this. It's a call and response where I ask it to do something and it responds. Agency is the notion that it is situationally aware that it actually knows what to do and can proactively move upon us. These two combine to what I call the sense of liveness, a sense that there really is an other there, that it's not just a machine, but there's an augmented companion with which I can interact. We're very much moving in our industry from the Alexas and Cortanas of the world to more what Jarvis looks like. And I think that's a good thing. In fact, I would declare that we are on the cusp of a sea change in software development. And I know in the space world, you're going to have to be dealing with this as well, because now we're introducing machines that we don't just program, but we teach them and they learn. Now, AI is an overused term, but here's my litmus test for it. An artificial intelligence system, and actually I prefer to use the term not AI, I prefer, use the, prefer to use the term computational intelligence. It takes some of the emotion away from it. There are three things that distinguish it from a non-computational element uh, intelligence system. It understands, so there's some sense of understanding of the world and the ability for you to query the system and know why it did what it did. Especially true if I'm dealing with human critical applications. If this AI says, hey, I want you to you know, go this direction or I think you should follow this cancer treatment, I want to immediately go back and say, tell me why. So that's, that shows the understanding. There's a degree of reasoning as well too, inductive, deductive, and also reasoning that leads me to building theories of the world. We know how to do the first two, AI is moving in the last direction. And then lastly, and this is perhaps the most important thing that distinguishes it, the notion that it is a system that we don't just program, but it actually learns over time. And that introduces challenges of its own in the software development life cycle. But those are the three things that distinguish AI systems, and those are the kind of systems that many of us are building these days. We've been trying to take those ideas, we IBM are trying to take those ideas to space. There's some fascinating work we've been doing with uh, uh, Ames in building a flight controller, a flight operations advisor. Consider the situation. This is a decision problem where I've got uh, on the ground, I've got flights around me, uh, they may be conflicting with one another, they may be an emergency situation, and the humans on the ground have to make some very rapid decisions. Most of the work that's been going on in AI, look at AlphaGo and things like this, wonderful stuff, is largely on the end of what I call signal AI. Managing images and video and voice, good stuff, but there's also work to be done in AI in decision planning, and that's where we've been trying to apply it here. So we've been applying some of the Watson services that in effect offer an, uh, a, a kind of a cognitive advisor to the folks on the ground who are running flight operations and help them faster than another human can do. It understands flight operations. It understands the situational awareness of what the world is at that very instant and can advise. We did a similar thing at Langley, but for the pilot. 
So imagine now in an aircraft of any particular type, I have a bird strike, for example, and I need to respond very quickly. So similar to what we did on the ground, here is a, an AI decision support system that we've tried to apply up in the air as well too, again using Watson services. Now there's an interesting engineering challenge here because we're dealing with systems that are very close to the ground and so it's possible to do things in the cloud. What we're seeing is the pendulum moving back and forth. The world of software has moved very much to the cloud, which is wonderful and good and I think it's great, but there are a number of use cases that push us back to the edge as well. And this is the beginnings of them. And especially as I move to low earth orbit and beyond, I can't rely upon the, crowd, on the, on the cloud. I must take, in effect, mission control with me in the walls of my spacecraft. We've been also doing an interesting experiment with a system called Simon, and this is in conjunction with Airbus. Uh, Simon was recently launched. There is an astronaut from Germany uh, up, uh, up on the uh, space station right now, and Simon was put together as an experiment for that astronaut to be a companion for him. It's the crew interactive mobile companion. So we've got this little ball here. It's got a little emoji face. It has fans so it can move about, and the intent is it's to provide a companion and a helpmate for that astronaut. Simon is able to see, it actually has cameras and it can detect that, oh, it's you and not some intruder or some other person. I assume you leave the doors locked up there. It's, <laughs> right. Uh, it is able to respond based upon emotion. Is the astronaut smiling? Is he frowning? Is he throwing things at me? I don't know if we trained that, but you get the idea. It's some emotional response. It can listen to commands, and it also knows some things about the procedures. So it's the beginnings of an experiment of human, human and, and companion and AI connecting together. And we think that that can go even further. In fact, that's where we began with an interesting project in body cognition a few years ago. We were facing a very interesting technical problem that had nothing to do with space, and that is we saw on the horizon the need for systems that were symbolic in nature, our traditional stuff we've been doing for the last several decades, together with connectionist systems, systems that are basically neural networks. And we needed a way to bring those together. So we said, how do we architect these things so that these elements do work with one another? Well, we then began, when I say we, this is Rob High, the CTO of the Watson Group, and some of my colleagues down in Austin. We sat back and said, what would be a grand challenge that would really force us to consider some, some long-term hard problems. And we said, think about the mission to Mars for a moment. That much like I said with Simon, you can't rely upon mission control on the ground. You must take the mission control with you in the walls of the spacecraft. And additionally, we also, in working with the folks at, at Johnson Space Center, realized that NASA had aspirations to put robots on the ground of Mars as well too. So we stepped back and said, hmm, interesting situation. Could we build a system that would be that kind of companion, uh, but also, and you could take with you, and also work across platforms from being inside the spacecraft and on the ground and the, and the astronauts themselves, and the robots themselves. And we realized we know how to architect this. This is a solvable technical problem. And it led to a system we call SELF and a project we call INTO, which we've open sourced, by the way. Cool thing about this is we've applied it to a number of, a number of uh, platforms. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, there's a video in which we've applied this to the Robonaut 2. We've been working with a company called Woodside. You may say, why does an oil and gas company care about the, some of this stuff? Am I at my, am I at my end? No, yeah. Half, point. Half point. Okay, thank you. I'll talk even slower then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's right, we didn't give you a sign. I, I thought you were gonna dance on the table for me. So I've got time, good. So, so we worked with uh, Woodside because they said, why, why, does, and why does a company like that care about this? Well, they're dealing with situations that are, that are uh, very dangerous for humans on the oil rigs. And so they were very interested in seeing what kind of remote devices there could be on these rigs. And so we, we actually work with them on that project. There's, in the upper right-hand corner, this is where it gets kind of creepy. 
Uh, this is uh, a system from Soul Machines out of New Zealand. All cool stuff comes from New, from New Zealand, really amazing thing. We've applied this uh, to a number of banks, uh, to insurance companies in Australia. That is not a person, that's actually a digital human. And so Mark Sager, who is behind this, uh, ha he, he sort of cut his teeth on the movie Avatar. He was the gentleman that John Cameron brought in to do all the amazing effects of putting cameras on the actors' faces and then being able to translate those and map those to an avatar. And that's what they have done to these faces. Their first project was a thing called Baby X, and they've now moved to adult faces and Watson Services behind it. What we were trying to do in this case is, could you actually make them very personal? And lastly, we did this in terms of spaces. And think about the wide range of spaces. It's not just inside a spacecraft, but a car is also a space. Uh, I'd like to sit inside my car and maybe have my cognitive assistant move with me from my house to my office to my car. And much like Jarvis, it knows about me. So what's the characteristics of that? A degree of situational awareness, a sense of it building models of the space in which it's in, and also, and this is where it gets kind of creepy, being able to build a theory of mind of itself and of you so it achieves that level of liveness. So what we found is that we knew how to architect something that could cross all of those platforms, and to a degree it solved the problem we had of integrating connectionist and symbolic systems together. Um, I'll run this video in a minute, but uh, Julia uh, Badger and her colleagues has a paper coming out, uh, the Robonaut 2 and Watson, in which they have demonstrated how these two come together. I don't know if I can click it or you can back there, but could we run this, this video? This is an example of where we're using into, uh, I don't know if the sound is running. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Take two. There we go. What is your name? My name is Robinot. He commanded it to turn the valve. And he got the thumbs up. Cool. So you can see the direction we're headed here. And again, our vision was, could we actually put this inside the spacecraft itself? That's where we'd like to go. L let me end up with one story here. And we have some time for Q&A. Uh, this is uh, Margaret Hamilton. Uh, she's the woman who invented, coined the term software engineering. She's standing by a printout of, uh, of the Apollo code itself. I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Barry Bame some years ago, wonderful gentleman. And this is a story about the mysterious and wonderful nature of software. And you can see why I was called to this space. Uh, I'm about to tell you the story. It's mostly true. The dialogue is a little bit, a little bit paraphrased, but, but you'll get it. You'll appreciate it. So Barry is working on a satellite. And as you know, with all devices like this, weight's very important. Placement is very important. Got to get the center of gravity right. So the weight control officer came in and said, uh, Dr. Bame, how much does your software weigh? And Dr. Bame said, why it weighs nothing. And the weight control officer said, ah, impossible. It has to weigh something. You're creating something. We're spending all this money. It has to weigh something. Go think about it for a while, and I'll come back and you tell me. So weight control officer comes back to Barry, and Barry has at this time arranged all the punch cards of all his software. Weight control officer asks, how much does your software weigh? Barry says, it still weighs nothing. Weight control officer says, but I see all these cards. It must be hundreds of pounds. And Barry replies, ah, but the software is not in the cards. The software is in the holes. Ooh. <laughs> Software is the invisible language that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. Software is the invisible language that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. 
The stars call to you. What stories will you tell it? Thank you very much. You want to come on up? And operators are standing by. I think uh, we have, uh, I guess questions have come in through the app and uh, we're gonna hear some of those questions from the back. And I'll, I'll take the easy ones and you take the hard ones. Uh, I was planning on the other way around. Okay. <laughs> you take the nouns, I'll take the verbs. Okay, cool. I think there were some questions in the back. I guess this is rather than using microphones, so, so mic. send, send them, you Please have a mic? questions okay. in the audience. Yeah. We'll start with that first. Okay. Great. I think we have one over here, but it's gonna take me a few minutes to walk over. <laughs> one second. Do you wanna come meet me? I like your pitch, that was nice. Oh, thank you. She, she was, was great, loved it. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is more about um, the future of uh, exploration. Um, so my understanding is that when we develop these complex softwares, we're depending on the learning data that we feed it. And as we move to new vehicles, these are one of a kind systems that are probably gonna be flown one, two times. How do you envision um, being able to adapt these uh, advanced uh, automation to deal with such a limited data set? So I'd, mm. I'd just like your insight on that. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have some answers. So, so let's talk about that. Uh, first off, the space is already by its very nature, a high risk environment. So from a systems engineering perspective, the last thing you want to do is to add software components that add risk as opposed to reduce risk. So the advice I offer is, especially where we are now with AI systems, be very cautious about where you play, apply the AI pixie dust because indeed we don't fully understand how to deal with components that are not fully testable or trustable or at least only have some degree of, of, of correctness that they give us. So be careful about where you put those in the systems. That being said, we do have a long history of data of the physics of the world in which these systems work. We do have lots of models for those one-of-a-kind things that they have been so vigorously tested on the ground. So in a way, I would kind of dispute your assertion that we're limited in data because probably, or hopefully, there's enough of those models on the ground that we can train those kind of things. And therefore, when I take them to space, the systems engineering strategy says, don't rely upon the things it has to learn out there uh, that I've not tested on the ground. So that's, that's my systems engineering answer to that. Yeah, the, I think the other thing I would add is that you also have to be cognizant of the platform that you go and pick. Some of them are very good with limited data sets, some of them are not. Um, and those are some of the things we're trying to change maybe in some of those deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow as an example. Right. It's very good with very large data sets. So be careful. Um, go investigate, pick, and, uh, and spend your time wisely on the ground. I'd love to chat with you afterwards as to understanding what kind of data sets and problems you'd like to throw at this. So is the Turing test obsolete or no? Is the Turing test obsolete? Well, the Turing test is a strange thing that I don't think there really is a meaningful Turing test. There is an illusion of intelligence we can have behind this, but I don't think there's, there's anybody that could tell you here is a litmus test for does this machine pass sentience or not. I think that we are moving closer and closer to it. Uh, now, this is my personal belief, not necessarily that of IBM or anybody living or dead, but I personally believe that consciousness is an illusion and it's possible for us to build machines that achieve the illusion of consciousness. So I think we're on the path where we're generations away. Mm -hmm. That's something that I don't fear, but it's actually, I think, very exciting. Most of the interesting problems are still in simple machine learning right now. You don't need to have an intelligence to solve yep. most of the problems of the world. Over here. Yes, uh, one of the interesting twists you had uh, 
a number of allusions to control systems where you have a transition from you know, uh, you know, Earth-based control to uh, significant distances and eventually you have to be on your own. So, which brings up the more general case of being able to build near real-time state models of systems of systems. Have you looked into the working that as a general problem as opposed to just point design work? I know that IBM in particular has lots of experience in ultra complex systems. Yeah. And I could probably point you to a few folks who are far more expert in that than I am. I'm thinking of this guy that'll come to mind in a moment. I'm terrible with names. So a short answer is I know that there is such work going on. I know also that the work that we help pioneer in SysML to help model these kind of systems has helped as well. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a damn hard problem. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Okay, one over here. Oh, perfect. Thank you for your presentation. That, the Simon experiment was, was interesting and peculiar. I'm not sure how I feel about having a device hanging over my shoulder um, mim mimicking some sort of relationship. Can you tell us um, what sort of bond, if any, formed between the human and the machine? I'm not suggesting a human-to-human bond, but how would you characterize that relationship? Well, they met on Tinder, so. <laughs> but but it, it's, it's your guess where it's gonna go from there. At the moment, I have three robots living with me. I have, seriously, I have two little now robots. They stand about this tall. And uh, a, a pepper, which stands about this tall. You must realize that my wife has an unnatural relationship with a Roomba. She, <laughs> she, she loves her Roomba. She gives it a pet name. You, sh you should see what she says to Pepper. Yeah. So the curious thing is that, and this is an interesting part of human computer interactions, it appears that especially humanoid robots and robots with faces like Simon has or Baxter from Rethink Robotics, there's value in that because it's intended to provide a bonding and provide a level of trust. If I am going to delegate some of what I do to a cognitive assistant, there's actually value in having it have some degree of personality because the level of trust behind, between the two can increase. And especially as we think out to long range missions, frankly, and I think this is an unexplored area, the ability for that to provide some degree of companionship is not a bad thing. And there's precedence for this. Look at how we've been seeing these kinds of ideas applied in elder care, where the notion of a bonding actually is very helpful, helpful and healthy for the human. So some people may think it's creepy. I think it's both inevitable and irreversible and a good thing. Do you have an opinion on that one? One more no. question. <laughs> the two of you presented almost as if you were two different projects. But I'm wondering why when you do the call for code, why did you ask humans to write the code? Why didn't you ask Watson to write the code? I tried. Grady was too busy to get his bots to go and do it. Maybe next time they'll join us. But We're, it's a serious question. We are a long way away. Well, actually, I take that back. We already have machines that produce code. We call them compilers, seriously. So in effect, what you're talking about is raising the level of abstraction so that our machines, our AIs, can begin to write the code. But it still means moving up the level of abstraction for how we specify those systems. And I think that will continue on. I've begun to see experiments where we're seeing AIs that act as a companion to the code writer saying, hey, I see a pattern here. You should try this or that. I've seen AIs also help out with regards to what should be tested or not. So we're at the early stages of where I think AI can influence the software development process. Much like COBOL, we're never going to, this is my opinion, we're never going to get away from humans being part of that process. But we'll make, really we'll make substantial progress. progress. Yeah, yeah, we'll make substantial progress. Yeah. But it raises a level of abstraction. Yeah. I have one more question, um, and then we can we can end the, the, this fantastic. Session. Oh, there you are. Sorry. 
Uh, what, what do you both yes. see as potential collaborations between IBM, the International Space Station, and CASIS? Great question. Yes. Three words, total world domination. Yes, I love it. <laughs> well, I guess, well, it's not just the world, though. No, the, no. the world is not the enough. World is, world is not enough, yeah. <laughs> I've watched too many movies, yeah, haven't I? Absolutely. So, so I think the short answer is, uh, Watson is an amazing set of technologies. And especially if you combine that with the open source things that have been done here, there is a wonderful soup of components with which people can come and start building some amazingly cool things. In addition, as you've seen some of the projects we've done, you know, bind with us here because we have some particular expertise in this notion of putting personas in spaces and we'd like to take that further. Yeah, and if you, if you look at the technologies that we're building, especially on the open source side, the things that are enabling container-based applications, cloud-native application development, they're a natural fit for what's going on there. And the collaboration that we can do and, and build upon in that space and, and the whole set of tools that surround that are just sky's the limit. IBM Pun has intended, a long right? history in space, and we're still there. Yeah. That's great. It's a total global Domin Total domination. world domination. Yeah. Total you. solar system domination. domination. How's there that sound? Go. Thank you so much. And please give another round of applause for these fantastic speakers. Thank you. Thank you. And Todd oh, thank you. Thank you.